Hello maths fans, Dr. Tom Crawford here at the University of Oxford and today I'm sitting the German high school maths exam. I have a feeling this may be the most difficult one that I've done yet, mainly because the actual exam paper is in German and I do not speak German. I am going to be relying on Google Translate alongside the original equations and figures from the German paper and I'm going to try and make sense of it all as well as obviously answering, hopefully, the maths questions correctly. I will be sitting part A of the 2019 Arbiter Mathematics exam which is taken by students in Germany when they leave school around the age of 18. The specific exam actually differs depending on the state this one comes from Bavaria, the region of Germany around Munich. I have a maximum of 90 minutes to answer all of the questions. I am not allowed a calculator and there is no formula booklet, so I'm pretty much on my own. Right, let's get started. Question one, lots of graphs. Um, so I can see from the translation, obviously not the German version, um, that it wants me, first of all, to determine the position and nature of the extreme points of the graph of f, where f is given by the following function. So we're saying that f of x is equal to e to the 2x divided by x, and I'm interested in stationary points, so that's going to be when the derivative is zero. So let's calculate the derivative, so f prime of x is, let's write this as uh, e to the 2x times x to the minus 1. Um, so if we differentiate exponential first, I'm going to get a 2e to the 2x times x minus 1. I'm going to get a minus uh, x to the minus 2 times e to the 2x. And then I want to solve for that being equal to 0. Derivative being 0 gives you your stationary points. Um, so I can say f prime of x is naught when I can ignore the exponential because exponentials are never zero. So we can cancel that. So it's when 2 over x equals 1 over x squared. So that tells me that 2x squared equals x, which tells me that x is naught is one option. Uh, and then if I can now divide by that x or 2x equals 1, so x equals a half. Okay, now looking back at the question and my translation, uh, it does say the domain excludes zero because of course when x is zero up here, so I should have written x non-zero, so we can ignore that one. So it's gonna be when x is a half uh, and it says the nature of the extreme point. So if we know that, um, can I think about what this is going to look like? Possibly, though it's probably going to want me to show it. So I was thinking I could draw the graph and then argue why it's a max or a min, uh, but they probably want me to show why that's the case, so I'm guessing second derivative. So if I calculate second derivative, I'm going to get f double prime um, is equal to, fun, um, 4 e to the 2x, x minus 1, minus 2 e to the 2x, x minus 2 for the first term using the product rule. And then for the next term, I'm now going to get a minus, so plus, plus 2, x to the minus 3, e to the 2x, and then a minus 2x to the minus 2, e to the 2x. Right. Again, I know the exponential is non-zero. Uh, and always positive, and I'm only interested in whether the second derivative is positive or negative, for max or min. Uh, so I can sort of ignore that. Um, so let's cross that off in a different color. So I can kind of ignore the exponential, which simplifies things a little. Um, so I can say that f double prime is e to the 2x, and then the bracket, I've got 4 over x minus 2 over x squared plus 2 over x cubed, minus another 2 over x squared, so minus 4 over x squared. Uh, and I want this at x equals a half. f double prime is equal to e 
times four divided by a half, so that's double, so that's eight, minus four divided by a quarter, so that's 16, plus two divided by one eighth, so two times eight is 16. So I think that's 8e, doesn't actually matter because that is positive. So a positive second derivative is a minimum. Uh, so this is a minimum. All right, is that all I have to do for that one? Um, I think that might be. Okay, awesome. So I think that was one part one, one part two, I believe. Um, Having a lot of difficulty with this uh, language issue, but anyway, um, okay, so given its function, right, so we have a new function, I think, a new function for part two, which is f of x is now given by one minus one over x squared, okay, um, and zeros, tell me when the zeros are at, um, minus one and two. Okay, so zeros at x equals minus one, yeah, and x equals two. Do I agree with that? Mm, I don't think it does have a zero and x is two. Oh, minus one and one. Good one, translate. Okay, <laughs> that makes sense. Yes, I agree with that. Zeros and x is minus one and one. Okay. Figure one shows the graph of f, which is symmetric about the y-axis. I also agree with that. Furthermore, the straight line g with the equation y equals minus three is given. Okay, fine. So I'm just gonna draw this out for myself. So we've basically got like a, um, this, okay, this, We've got something coming in and going through one and then coming down here like so. Similar thing here, it's symmetric coming in through minus one, sure. So this x is minus one, x is plus one. So this is x and this is y. And then y is minus three. So let's say that's down here. So what is it wanting me to do then? Um, Okay, uh, show that one of the points where G intersects the graph of F has the X coordinate one half. Sure, so I'm saying um, we want to solve uh, minus three, which is of course Y, and we want when that is equal to one minus one over X squared, uh, and then we just solve that algebraically, I think, uh, and this is part A, just to keep track. Okay, so minus three x squared equals x squared uh, minus one. So I can take that across and say uh, plus, so four x squared is therefore equal to one. x squared is uh, a quarter. So that tells me that x is plus or minus one half. Excellent, I hope it asked me to find the second one. Um, it doesn't, but anyway, uh, so it definitely, there when x is a half, fine. Part B, determine arithmetically the content of the area enclosed by the graph of f, the x-axis, and this line. Right, so I'm gonna use a different color. Um, so we want this area. So if I work out one lot of it and then just multiply it by two, that will give me the whole thing. Um, okay, okay. So, and we have worked out this part, haven't we? Gotcha. So this is when x is equal to a half. Um, so I've got a rectangle there. Um, right, let's use another color because I'm now gonna say the rectangle area I can work out. So the rectangle area is equal to uh, three multiplied by half, basically is three over two. And then the sort of curved bit, which I will shade in yellow here. So then that part is gonna be a rotation. So I think I'm gonna do a rotation. 
not a rotation. I'm not thinking of forming a volume of revolution. I'm going to do the integral between two points, I think, for that. So, if I integrate negative of the function to make it positive. Uh, oh, no, I can just integrate between these two points and remember that it's a positive answer. Okay, let's do that instead. So I think the yellow area is equal to the integral of the function. Um, so the function there is one minus one over x squared dx. And we're going from x is equal to a half to x is equal to one. So I think, I believe that is gonna be the answer. That will come out negative. I will then take the modulus of it and add it to the rectangle. That's the plan. Okay, so um, let's do the integral. So that's then um, x and it's minus x to the minus two. So it's gonna to be to the minus one. So I think it's x minus one over x. So if I differentiate minus x to the minus one, bring the minus one down, no, so it's plus x plus one over x, because if I differentiate x to the minus one, I get minus x to the minus two, which is what I've got there. Okay, so it's that between one and a half. Um, so that is then plugging in one, that's then two minus the value at a half, which is a half plus two. So it's two minus two and a half, so it equals minus a half. So the total area, therefore, is a half. It's the modulus of that. Uh, so I think the yellow area is a half. So the total is a half plus three over two. Um, so let's say this now. So I can say now the, um, so the positive part to the right of that y-axis um, has area two. And then we multiply by two because of the symmetry. So I think the total area is equal to four, is my answer, I think. Question three, I guess. All right, so far so good. Um, figure two below shows the graph of a function. It does. Um, one of the following graphs, here we go, uh, belongs to the first derivative of f. Okay, so let's just sketch out f is going to help me here, I think. So it's going something like that. It's going steeper there, and it's going up there, and it's going like that. Right, so what I'm going to do to start with here is just label where the derivative is positive and negative. And I think that'll help me. Um, so we've got a negative, 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 and then it's obviously going to be zero, and then it's positive right the way through. Um, and then here it's positive, and then here it's gonna be zero. So, looking at those graphs, I need something that is positive at both ends. So, that can be all of them, great. Uh, so to pass through zero, oh, it's actually giving me specific points here? Yikes, okay. Um, so it looks like it's, turning it two and minus two. Okay, so I think this is minus two, and this is plus two. Assuming these graphs are accurate, they're usually not, but it doesn't say not drawn accurately, so I'm gonna go with it. So then I want it to go through zero at those two points, basically. Um, so therefore it could be one or three. So that rules out number two, because that doesn't go through zero at those points. Um, and does it appear to be getting steeper? It does appear to be getting steeper. But what's the gradient at zero? Um, it's sort of getting, is it's definitely a negative gradient and it's at its steepest, but would it be, ooh, is it going super negative or is it pretty chill on the negativity? Oh, dearie me. Okay, so I have to explain why just read more of the question it says, so I can say that it's, it's definitely not, so I can say not two since um, derivative is zero at uh, x approximately plus or minus two, which isn't true in number two. 
Now for the others, it's to do with how steep that gradient is. So looking at that, it's, it's less than one. The gradient is less than one. Uh, and then so I can say it's also not three since I believe the gradient between um, plus or minus two is less than one. It's, yeah, it's a shallower gradient, less than one. So less than uh, one with its modulus. So it's like, I don't wanna say that, uh, not less than one, greater than minus one is, let's say greater than minus one. Let's go with that. Um, not quite as steep as what I'm trying to say. It's a bit shallower, uh, but that means it's greater than minus one, greater than minus one. So therefore our answer is one, is um, what I'm going with. Okay, uh, oh, that was just part A, cool. Uh, and then part B, what's that asking me to do now? Um, Okay, uh, the, I read the German one for a second, I'm very confused. Uh, B, the function f is an antiderivative of our original function, so an integral, okay. Give the monotonic behavior of f in the interval uh, one to three and justify it, okay. Uh, so we want the integral of this, so let's write it up here. So integral of this from um, one to three is the interval there. Okay, so um, it's going through zero a little bit past. So three is about there, and one is about there. So what's happening to the function? So um, what I'm going to assume is the graph in front of me is now a derivative. Okay. So let's think about what's happening to this function. Um, so it's going between one, let's put that as two and let's put that as three. And now what do I know about its derivative? So its derivative is always negative. Okay, so um, derivative of f is negative on the range one, three. So it's always negative, so it has to be that negative slope. Now, it's most negative near to two, I think. Yes, it's most negative. So most negative near x is approximately two. So what's that's gonna say here is it's steepest, it's steepest near that point, most negative, and then it gets less negative, sort of thing here, but it's like, it's got to stay, it's got to always stay negative, it's steeper there, and then it kind of tails off, so it's flat, steeper, flat, is that what I mean? I think it's something like that. Um, give the monotonic behavior of f. Ah, so it didn't want me to draw it. So f decreases, i.e. f decreases monotonically because its gradient is always negative. Yeah, 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 I'm happy with that. f decreases monotonically on one, three. I think it looks something like my sketch, uh, but question didn't ask me that, I just assumed it did <laughs> incorrectly and did lots of extra work. I think it just decreases monotonically. I'm going with that. Uh, right, and that is the end of three. That is the end of three, let's try question four. Uh, a set of functions, h, k, where k is real and plus, or complicate. Very good job I've got this translation. <laughs> question four, so we have a um, a set of functions, h, k, where k belongs to the positive reals, okay, differ only in their respective domains. Uh, their respective di differentiable? Their respective domains dk differentiate. 
I'm going to assume this means the domain over which they are differentiable. Um, <laughs> I knew I was going to run into issues with this, <laughs> with this crude translation. I'm going to take it to mean uh, differ, uh, differ on domain where differentiable. I'm calling that apparently DK. So, and we're going to be given what they are. Okay, that helps. Um, so HK maps X, so we're told HK maps the function X to uh, cos of X. Okay, great. Uh, and we're told with DK is naught to K. Okay, so it's just some positive real number. Sure. Um, thing four shows the graph of the function h7. Okay, so e.g. h7, uh, defined on right naught to seven, that's what they've drawn, good. Um, be the largest possible value of k such that the associated function hk is reversible. Okay, so I'm assuming by reversible they mean inverse. Um, so we want to know where, so we can say it's invertible. And by invertible, I mean an inverse exists um, whenever it's one to one. Um, whenever it is one to one. So that's going to mean if it's starting at zero, which is going to be one. That's right, yeah, large possible value of k. So it starts at zero. And then as soon as I get to the point three, no, not quite three, the point pi, then we hit minus one and then it begins to come back and repeat. So it has to be minus one. Um, first one over that, so uh, which is on naught to pi. Yeah. Okay. Pi is a positive real number, so that's okay. Right, I'm going to go with that. Uh, okay, draw the graph of the inverse function, great, uh, of this, uh, for this value of k. Okay, in figure four, paying particular attention to the intersection of the graphs of the function and the inverse. Oh. So I've got to draw an accurate sketch, bloody hell. All right, <laughs> don't even have the square paper that they've... <sighs> Reminds me of... Uh, my feathering graphs I did in the GCSE maths one. Bad times. Getting flashbacks. Okay, um, so let's try and draw something vaguely accurate. So if I have the following, we've got um, something like this, and then we've got this thing coming down and right. So it's cos of x, so this is y. I'm drawing y equals cos of x to start. Uh, and we're going across to pi, and um, we're going to have a pi by 2 in the middle. Um, so I know that cos comes down and goes through. It's a very bad effort at cos, but anyway. Uh, and that's going to be at 1. And then down here we've got minus 1, um, which is going to be this point. So then I just need to take that and then just reflect it beautifully. Okay. So let's suppose that's an accurate <laughs> drawing of the original function. So this is h pi. Now, if I wanted to invert that, then for example, so if I were to write that as h pi inverse, if you input um, pi, no, h pi inverse, so that is defined for values between minus one and one. Okay, so defined on um, minus one to one. Uh, and so it's basically, it's like that, isn't it? So if I were to draw this now, it's like reflecting in the line y equals x when you take an inverse function, I believe, because you're basically swapping the roles. You've got like y equals a function of x and you're trying to rearrange to get x equals a function of y. So you're flipping, you're reversing that y and x behavior. Um, so I think what it's going to do then is pi by 2 is like, yeah, so it's only actually defined um, between here, so let's call this one minus 1, 
and then one's going to be like here. So when I input one, it's come from zero. So it, so it has the value of zero at one. And then when I input minus one, it has the value of pi for the inverse function. So pi is like up here. Okay, so suppose this is accurate. Again, we're going to pretend this is accurate. So now if I try and join these up, what's going to happen? So as we go through one, when we get to the point, zero has come from pi by two. Zero has come from pi by two. So over here, we're like here, it's like pi by two. And then a little bit near one, we're like, the value's still quite close to zero. Yeah, so that means it's coming in like that, doesn't it? Okay, so I think it's gonna look something like, and then it kind of flips that way. Is that what I think it looks like? Oosh. I think it's sort of looking something like that. Um, that is, yeah, because then if I were to draw that, I think that's right, because then if I were to actually draw in the line, for example, if we had a y equals x line, it's going to go right through there, right? So this is the y equals x line. Yeah. I stand by that. It's not to scale, but I think it is going to be flipped like that. I'm going with it. Um, okay. Uh, paying too attention to the intersection of the graphs of the function and the inverse. Okay, so they want to know when they intersect. So they intersect when they're equal to each other. So this one is cos inverse. So you can say, um, I can say they intersect when cos minus one of x equals cos of x. Interesting. So when x equals cos of cos of x, yikes. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, um, when does x equal cos of cos of x? So let's think. So like cos of pi by four is like the whole root two over two thing, but then cos of root two over two is definitely not pi by four. Hmm. I don't know if I'm supposed to write down the point where they intersect. Um, I can sort of roughly see where it would be. Uh, maybe I'll just leave it at that. You possibly could work that out, but that seems right now I'm drawing a little bit of a blank. So I think I, I'm going to claim I've done a half decent job there. So maybe I'll move on. Uh, so for B, for B, for B, where are you? Um, okay, enter the term in R defines an invertible function J that satisfies the following condition. Ugh. Um, the graph of j and the graph of the inverse function of j have no point in common. Okay, this is, I think the translation's okay. So I have to come up with a function in R. So, so j, um, I'm guessing maps to the real numbers to the real numbers, right? So that's why the following condition, the graph of j and the graph of the inverse have no point in common. Oh, could I do, could I do, could I do, could I do? Um, so I immediately, and I thought of this when I was doing the, the cos and the uh, arc cos thing just now. I want to do like a, like a log thing, right? Because if I had a log, which kind of looks like this, and then I have an exponential, yeah, I think this is it, because then if you do the e to the x, it looks like that. And then you've got the line y equals x between those two things. Okay, so that's y equals x. This is um, going to be y equals ln x right there, and then this is y equals e to the x. 
and they do not intersect because they look like that. Yeah. Okay. So I think that would be my function. So invertible function j. So if I say j equals e to the x, I'm going with that. All right. What's next? I'm assuming question, what was that? Four, five should be next. Um, analysis task group two. These questions may only be worked on in connection with the questions belonging to the same group of questions. <laughs> Good one, Google Translate. In part B of the exam. So I'm not doing part B. So, ooh, they kind of look the same. Does that mean, wait, 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 wait. So, very much looks the same. Ah, should have read the instructions, but you know, they're in German. I believe I'm only meant to do one of the groups from analysis, I, I think. Because it's basically the same question with a few little modifications. So I don't know if it's a different syllabus or different schools do different parts. I honestly have no idea. Um, it's the, the instructions are just not really there uh, on the exam, <laughs> even once translated. Um, I'm sure somebody who has taken the German Arbiter mathematics exam will very happily tell me in the comments what I'm actually supposed to do. Uh, but I think I might just have to. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not meant to do the exact same question uh, and the fact it's labeled analysis task group one which is what I just did and now this one's labeled analysis task group two is suggesting to me that I'm just supposed to do one of those um, so I do know that the mark the total mark should be out of 30 and I think I've already done 20 marks so far have I have I done 20 marks so that was 10 another five yeah, so I've done four questions, each with five marks. Okay, so I think, <laughs> just shows you how well prepared I am for this one. I don't even know the instructions. I think I'm not supposed to repeat basically the same thing. Uh, and I think this means I'm supposed to go on to the next section. So if I look at the next section below, that is stochastic. Aufgabengruppe zwei. I remember as well as two. Uh, it's about the limit of my German. Uh, okay, so it's stochastic task group uh, two or task group one? Oh, there's, sorry, there's task group one and task group two. Group two has pictures, so I'm possibly tempted to go for two. I think I'm gonna go for two. I don't know if I'm allowed to switch between task group one and two. I honestly have no clue, but two has pictures. I like pictures. I'm going to pick stochastic group two. So, and this is only five marks, so hopefully it isn't too bad, but we'll see, I guess. Um, oh no, 10 marks. Okay, 10 marks then. Fine, 10 marks. Uh, either way, stochastic task group two is what I'm going to do. Um, right. Uh, so, this is now stochastic um, question one. Let's see what we got. Okay, uh, one A. A wheel of fortune consists of five sectors of equal size. Um, okay, so each one is 72 degrees. I'm just going to write that down immediately, just in case. Um, one of them is labeled naught, one is labeled one, and the other one is labeled two, and then the other two sectors are labeled nine. Okay, um, so let's, let's draw a picture. Uh, so I'm going to assume they're equal in size. One's labeled zero. Okay. Um, so let's attempt to draw like fifths. This is going to go really wrong. Meh, not bad. Um, so they're equal size, yes. So let's suppose that's zero, that's a one. One of them's labeled two, and then the others are labeled nine. Okay, and they are equal size. Right, so I'm going to assume that means equal probability, but we'll see. Um, it's spun four times. Calculate the probability of getting the numbers 2019 in the order given. Okay, so we want the probability of two um, and followed by uh, zero uh, and one and nine. 
Okay, so they're all independent events. Doesn't matter what you spun previously. I'm going to assume equal probability. Uh, so by independence, um, I'm going to say by independence, that is just the probability of a two multiplied by the probability of a zero multiplied by the probability of a one multiplied by the probability of a nine. The order actually won't matter, it turns out. Um, no, so if I'm gonna get a two on the first one, that's one out of five, multiplied by the probability of getting a zero, um, that's one out of five. Probability of getting a one, one out of five. Probability of getting a nine, two out of five. So that's gonna be two divided by uh, 25 squared, 625. Okay, so that's my answer. Uh, right, part B. That was A, yes. Part B. Um, the Wheel of Fortune is spun twice. Find the probability the sum of the numbers obtained ooh, is at least 11. Interesting. So I want the probability sum at least 11, so greater than or equal to 11, uh, from two spins. Okay, so let's think about what spins can we get that make it greater than or equal to 11. So what could we have? Um, so that would be a nine followed by a two. We could have a nine followed by a nine. They would both work. Uh, and then we could have a two followed by a nine or again a nine and a nine where the nines are in the other order. Okay, so we have to get a nine and we have to get a two. Um, so, 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 so. Let's just do these individually. Okay. I could try and be clever and use like a probability of getting a two or a nine and figure it out from there, but these are the four things that we can get. It covers all the orders. I don't even need to do combinatorics, so I'm gonna keep it simple. I think these are the four things. Uh, so the probability of getting a nine followed by a two, um, what's the probability of that? Uh, well, getting a nine is two fifths times one fifth. So that is two out of 25. Probably of getting two nines is four out of 25. Probably of getting two and then a nine is two out of 25. And then nines, but the other way around is four out of 25. Okay. So I think that's gonna give me 12 out of 25. Uh, does that feel right? That probably feels right. Okay, so I think the answer then is 12 out of 25. Um, okay, and then there's a part, no, that was question two, okay. All right, I hope that was right. Uh, going with it, um, yeah, stick with it. Okay, it's good question two then. Um, so a binomial distributed random variable, uh, x with a given, with the parameter value, ooh, x with the parameter value is given five equals. It's a good translation again. So what is it actually saying? N equals five. Okay, so we have uh, question two. So we're told that X belongs to binomial. And so you normally need N and P, but I'm being told that N is five, and I don't know what P is. So P is gonna be my probability. Okay. Um, the diagram in figure one is giving me the probabilities of getting the other things. Right. Sure. Complete the TOC5 equals. <laughs> Complete the what? Complete the, oh, the value for getting five. Okay, the five including the probability in the diagram and determine the approximate probability that X is two. Right, so I think, terrible translation, I think. <laughs> And the formatting, I think I'm supposed to work out the probability that x equals five. So uh, what is, okay, what is the probability that x is equal to five? Um, and I have the values for the others. Right, so that's like 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 3, 2, 0.1, right. Um, so the probability that x is less than or equal to, isn't it? Yes, so on the diagram, probability that x is equal to five, well, that's just equal to one. So on the diagram, 
which I think it is asking me to complete the diagram. I think it's asking me to complete the diagram. So the probability of x equals to 5 is 1. So it's like, it's a cumulative frequency diagram. So um, it's just going to be full, full column up to 1. All right, I can hopefully I get the point across. Um, and then it says the approximate probability that x equals 2. Um, okay, so um, I want to know the probability that x equals 2. And from the diagram, the diagram tells me the probability that x is less than or equal to 2, because it's, again, cumulative. It's hard to say that word. Cumulative? Cumulative. I almost said cumulative. No, it's just cumulative. Cumulative? Cumulative. Cumulative or cumulative? Who knows? <laughs> that one where you add them up. Probability of x is less than or equal to 2. Um, so that's coming in at like 0 0.4... I don't know, it's like 0 0.42? I'm going to call that 0 0.42 or 43. 43. 0 0.43. And the probability that x is less than or equal to 1 is approximately... What's that one saying? That's about a 0 0.15. So therefore... The probability that x equals 2 is the probability of being less than or equal to 2 minus the fact that you could be 0 or 1. So minus probability x less than or equal to 1. Uh, so that's approximately 0 0.43 minus 0 0.15. So I reckon that is about 0 0.28. That's going to be my answer for that one. Uh, and that's it for question 2. So just question 3 now. I like this. I uh, don't normally like probability, but this is okay. Uh, so question three, what are you saying? Uh, you're telling me a uh, tree diagram. I liked my diagrams. Uh, so we have a tree diagram, blah, 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 belongs to random experiments, Cassie independent events A and B, determine the probability of event B. Okay. Cool, so. What have we got? Diagram looks weird. I feel like maybe they're using different notation to what I'm used to, but uh, I think let's just give it a go. So we've got an A bar, which I'm going to guess means not A. Um, so maybe don't write it like that. Okay. So let's go for this. So it's an A bar or A. So this one has to be a third, and this one has to be two thirds. So I'm given the two thirds, so it's obviously one minus that. Um, and then I'm told that then getting B from here gives you a total. That's right, total. Also interesting, in this exam, it's a vertical tree diagram, but as you can see, I'm drawing it horizontal. So this is like the, let's say, the standard way of doing it in the UK. Is the horizontal tree diagram, so I'm going to stick with that. Um, so I think the total they're saying is 2 out of 15. Right. And I need to work out the probability of getting B. Well, I actually don't care about the others then, do I? So, so I could obviously add in these, but I don't think this matters because I don't have enough information. But what I do know is... I think what this is telling me anyway, and they're independent events. Independent events. So I know that the probability of not A and then getting B is 2 fifteenths, but that has to be equal the probability of not A times the probability of B. And I know the probability of not A is 2 thirds, so that's just 2 thirds times probability of B. So therefore, the probability of B is just 1 fifth. Right, it's two first times fifth, two fifteenths. Yeah, all right, cool. I think that's the end of stochastics. So it would appear the next place to go to is geometry. Um, and again, we've got task group one and task. Now I know how it works. <laughs> um, okay, something about rectangles and midpoints, um, and something about balls or spheres. I'm gonna pick spheres over rectangles. It looks like 3D coordinate geometry, I think, if I've understood the notation, which I may not have, but hey-oh, what are you going to do? Uh, I can only make my best possible guess. 
<laughs> given the, uh, the level of translation quality. Uh, it's going to be geometry test two. Okay, so spheres, um, given by center, interesting notation. Uh, not sure what's going on here, but let's write it out. Uh, question, I'm going to assume this is a German specific notation, um, but I'm going to interpret this as best I can. Uh, so I think what it's telling me here, best guess, is that there's a sphere K1, which has center uh, one, two, three. So I think that's the X, Y, Z coordinate. They're using like a vertical line notation. Never seen that, but I'm gonna go with that. Um, and then minus three, minus two, one. Oh, what was the radius? Radius five. Okay, radius five, um, R equals five. And then we had K2, which was a second sphere. And that has a center at minus three, minus two, minus, minus one, plus one. And also has R equals five. Okay, good. Show that yourself, <laughs> K1 and K2 cut. Show that yourself, K1 and K2 cut. Intersect, show they intersect. I'm going with show, right, show they intersect. Uh, so, they will intersect uh, if distance between centers is less than sum of radii, I think. So let me, I'm going to draw a little picture, which obviously will be in 2D. Uh, but the idea is to say there's like a center here and then there's a center here. So if we know the distance between the centers, and then this one's got like a radius, and this one also has a radius. So it's like the two. Yeah, if the distance between the centers is less than, then they have to overlap. I think I'm happy with that, less than the sum of the radii. So it's less than 10. Okay, so I wanna show you the distance. Okay, so IE, uh, distance between these two vectors. So the distance between one, two, three, and minus three, minus two, one, is less than or equal to 10. Yeah. Okay, so that distance uh, is then the same as figuring out, um, so the distance between two points I remember how to do this. You take the difference and then square. So it's one minus minus three squared plus two minus minus two squared plus three minus one squared. And then the square root of that. Yes, if I square both sides, that's got to be less than or equal to 100. Yes. So that's equivalent to saying is... Um, so that's four squared, so that's 16, uh, plus another 16, uh, plus two is less than or equal to 100. It's a lot less. Um, is that right? That has to be right. No, it has to be right. Uh, so this is true. They intersect provided 34 is less than or equal to 100, which is true. Therefore, intersect. Okay. I'll buy that, I'll buy that. All right, uh, so that was A um, to the cut figure. So I guess I think, again, the intersection of K1 and K2 is a circle. Determine the coordinates of the center and the radius of this circle. Wow. Okay, center and radius of the intersecting circle. Okay, let's start with uh, Writing out the information that we have. Um, okay, 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 okay. So I've got equations for these, haven't I? So I can say x minus one squared plus y minus two squared plus z minus three squared has to equal the radius squared. So it has to equal 25. So that's k1. 
And then for k2, I've got x minus minus 3, so x plus 3 squared. Uh, y minus minus 2, so that's y plus 2 squared. And z minus 1, plus z minus 1 squared. And that has to be 25. So the intersection, it's true that both equations must be satisfied. Right. So if I subtract these things off, let's try that. Um, so if I subtract the equations, I think this will give me their plane of intersection, hopefully. So if I subtract the equations, okay, what does that give me? Um, so that tells me that um, x squared minus 2x plus 1, and then I'm going to subtract off the second one, which is x squared plus 6x plus 9. And then for the y's, I've got y squared minus 4x plus 4, and I'm going to subtract off the y squared y, the y squared plus 4y plus 4 term. And then for the z's, I've got z squared minus 6x plus 9, and I'm going to subtract away uh, that one, which is going to be z squared minus 2x plus 1. And it's equal to 0 because they're both 25 the same radius. All right, I think that's okay. Um, so let's do the x squareds go, the y squareds go, the z squareds go, which is promising for my plane equation. Um, and I'm left with a minus 2x minus another 6, so minus 8x, 1 minus 9 minus 8, minus 4y minus another 4y, so minus 8y, and then I've got plus 4 minus 4, so that vanishes, and then I've got a, it's not x, that's z, what am I writing, uh, minus 6z plus 2, so minus 4z, and I've got 9 minus 1, so plus 8 equals 0. Right, so I think the plane equation, therefore, taking all of those across, is going to be 8 lots of x plus y plus z over 2 on that side has to equal 0. Ah, because they all cancel. So, ooh, so I think plane of intersection is therefore interesting and zero lies on it so their plane of intersection is through the origin helpful i think helpful maybe uh, plane of intersection i believe is going to be uh, 2x plus 2y plus z equals naught. Right. So now I know z in terms of x and y. I think I can just substitute that back into my equation. I think. I'm going to try it. Um, so what can I say? So therefore, z is equal to minus two lots of x plus y. And so if I put that into one of my equations, uh, let's take the second one. So sub in, and I'm gonna get, this is so not the way to do this question. <laughs> anyway, I've gone down this route. So I'm gonna have to expand this out, I think, aren't I? Because it's not gonna look like what I want it to look like. Ooh, okay. Oh, I'm gonna have to, don't make me do a rotation. Anyway, um, x squared plus 6x plus 9 plus y squared plus 4y plus 4 and then plus z minus 1 squared. So, but I've already expanded that, haven't I? Yes. So now that's a plus z squared, which is going to be 4 lots of x plus y squared. That would be a z squared, yep. Um, sure, minus 2z, so that's then a plus 4 
lots of x plus y. Yep. And then a plus 1. And that's got to be 25. Okay. Um, so I'm now going to get a cross term, aren't I? Oh, I hate cross terms. Hmm. Maybe this isn't the way to go about it. This is tough. Because that's going to give me a, so this term here is going to be a 4, and then I'm going to have an x squared plus a 2xy plus a y squared. Oh, yeah. And then a 4x and a 4y. So I'm going to end up with a 5x squared from there and there. A 5y squared from there and there. Go 6x plus another 4 plus a 10x, okay, so that seems okay, plus an 8y, 8y, plus a 13 plus a 14, from those three numbers, but then I'm screwed over because I've got a plus 8xy, and that has to be 25. So it's this equation, but that 8xy won't let me write it as a nice circle. Because I think I have to make a rotation. What did the question ask for? Then the coordinates of the center and the radius. Ah, it's very annoying. Um, okay. Okay, so. Whilst Past Tom is clearly having a hard time trying to solve this question, let's head over to Maple Learn to see how it should be done. You can access the Maple Learn worksheet for yourself by clicking on the link in the video description. You'll not only see an alternative, and let's be honest, much quicker step by step solution, but also a neat visualization of the problem. The two spheres are shown in red and blue, and the plane of intersection which fortunately past Tom did calculate correctly, is shown in yellow. As we rotate the image, we can see that in the plane of intersection, we do indeed have a circle. Following the steps of the calculation and making the most of the computational power of Maple Learn, we can obtain the coordinates for the center of the circle as minus one, zero, two, and the radius, which has a value of four. To access the full version of Maple Learn, you can sign up for a discounted subscription using the code in the video description. Now, let's see how past Tom is getting on. In the means of fairness, I think I will call this me being stuck. Um, how many marks is this? Three marks in total. Ouch. So I potentially may have lost some marks there. Uh, but yeah, no, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I am drawing a blank as to how I'm gonna find the, the radius and the center of that circle. Um, as I say, I think I've got the plane of intersection, but then it's, I could try and project the plane into the x, y plane, ooh, but it wouldn't work quite like that, would it? Maybe, there's probably some kind of rotation that I could do, uh, but I think for now, at least, I'm gonna move on to, uh, what is it, the last question? I'm gonna move on to the very last question, <laughs> I think, and maybe I'll come back to that with some new inspiration. So I'll leave it as that equation in the orange box, which I think is right. I'm not even sure if that's right, um, but I will move on, um, I think, because I am trying to sort of speed run these things, let's be honest here, because obviously I should be able to do this. Uh, clearly there's there's some circles, spheres, it's, it's circle theorems again, basically, isn't it? Um, all right, well, let's do, as I say, let's finish with the last question then. Let's do question two um, in this geometry section. I bloody hate geometry. <sighs> Used to teach it as well, believe it or not. It's probably a good job I don't teach geometry anymore, uh, given my lack of knowledge of circles and spheres. Um, okay, so what is this saying now? The level, I think it means plane, um, given by, uh, what's that? Okay, so part A. We've got 3x1 plus 2x2 plus 2x3 is equal to 6. Okay, 
contains a point whose three coordinates coincide. So I'm guessing that means x1 equals x2 equals x3. So I think, I think, again, this could well be lost in translation, not sure, but I think that's what it means. Does it gonna ask me to, yeah, determine these coordinates. All right, well, let's try it. So let's call them all x. So I'm saying that 3x plus 2x plus another 2x is 6. So that's telling me that 7x equals 6. So that's telling me that x is 6 7. So I think they coincide when x1 equals x2 equals x3 equals 6 divided by 7. That's more like it. Okay. And then part B. Um, what am I going to do now? Show that the following statement is true. There are infinitely many planes that do not contain a point whose three coordinates are the same. Okay, so I have to show this statement is true. So I have to prove, prove question. So I think I have to prove infinitely many planes, infinitely, so there exist infinitely many planes that do not contain a point that do not contain a point whose three coordinates are the same with three equal coordinates. Okay. So let's think about this. So the equation for a plane, so the general plane equation would be ax plus by plus cz equals some constant d. So if uh, x equals y equals z, that's equivalent to saying I need a plus b. Ah, I, I think, I can see how this, think, I see how it's going to work. A plus B plus C times X has to equal D. So that would mean in such a situation, this would be X, Y, and Z. So if there was a point like this, so then you can, I see now. So therefore this fails. So therefore there is no such point when ever a plus b plus c equals zero. So our coefficients there, it's actually a normal to the plane, a, b, c. So when those coefficients add together to be zero, and there are infinitely many solutions, so from that one, and this has infinite solutions. Woo, because you can just fix a and then B and C can be anything like, you know, A, let's say A is zero, then make B one and C minus one, B two, C minus two, et cetera, et cetera. It's, there are very clearly infinitely many solutions when you can pick A, B and C. Um, okay, so I think that should prove part B, which just leaves me with this intersection of two spheres question. Bit of an anticlimax, but I think I'm gonna call it. Sorry, everyone. Can't do it. Can't figure out the uh, the center and the radius of the, of the intersection. I've got. I'm pretty confident. I've got the equation of the plane of intersection, and I'm almost certain I just need to rotate and then get a lovely new coordinate system where everything's going to work. But my brain has turned to mush. Apparently, the pressure of trying to do something timed and on camera and in exam conditions. Um, so I, I'm just going to call it there. Um, so. Yeah, all right, I got stumped. I got stumped by that last question. Well played, well played, Arbiter, well played. Especially considering it was only worth, how many marks was that meant to be? Three, only three marks as well. But I guess it's three out of, how many was the total out of 40? Ooh, so I've potentially lost like 10% of the marks, ouch. <laughs> Maybe that's why this exam is hard. 
because there's not actually that many marks available. So when you lose marks, they're going to affect your percentage. But I'm confident everything else I've done is okay, I think. Um, I may have made the odd slip, as we've seen. I, I do make algebraic slips. We all do. We're all human, part of being a mathematician. Um, but the rest of it, I think, was fine. Um, in terms of difficulty, compared to other exams I've been doing, definitely easier than the step paper, as it should be. Um, I would say harder than the SAT, the American exam. Probably harder than GCSE maths as well, um, even though it felt a little bit shorter, because it had that calculus and graph sketching, inverse function, and the proof at the end. They're quite advanced topics. Um, they feel more like the kind of thing you would see at A-level um, in the UK. So I'd probably put it sort of on par with like an A-level exam with some of the questions, particular like the one-to-one -one mapping or that proof at the end, possibly creeping into further maths territory, perhaps. Um, so, you know, somewhere in the middle, but apart from that circle question, circles again. Anyway, um, I really should revise circles. <laughs> circle theorem, circle equations, anything to do with circles. Clearly, I need to learn this. Um, and I can't actually mark this. Should have told you all this at the beginning, probably. Um, I can't find a mark scheme for this online. It says they're actually not available, and you should ask your teacher for a mark scheme uh, on the website where I found this one. So I can't mark it, but I'm pretty confident that everything else I did was okay. Obviously, I don't think I quite got the answer they were looking for on the intersection of the spheres. Maybe I'd pick up one mark of the three, but I'm confident that everything else I did felt okay, felt right, I think. Uh, I'm sure you'll all tell me in the comments if it wasn't, um, but, and you're very welcome to do so, please do. Um, but no, it was, it was good fun, as always. The, uh, the language thing was interesting with the, uh, the Google Translate uh, on, the, on the exam paper. Uh, was certainly something that's a new one. Um, but yeah, not quite perhaps the hardest, as I mentioned at the beginning, but somewhere, somewhere in the middle. So all that's left to say is thank you to all of you for watching. Please do remember to subscribe to the channel if you've enjoyed the video. And if you'd like to see more exam content, please do send in your suggestions. I'd love to do exams from other countries, having now covered the UK, quite a few from the UK. Obviously, I'm biased. Uh, the US and now Germany. I'd love to keep this going and try some others from around the world. So add your suggestions to the comments or you can get in touch using the contact form on my website. Go to tomrocksmaths.com, click contact and that comes straight through to my email. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe and I'll see you all very soon. Take care.